Dr. Steele is going to talk to us today about invasive species, and uh, obviously we're sort of a small room. If, if people come in, we'll just let them let them all uh, keep coming in. I'm not sure if people know what room we're in, but other than that, uh, Claire, take it away. So welcome everybody. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for coming today. Uh, I'm Claire Steele, and uh, this is a lecture that this is a truncated version of a lecture I'd usually give in a conservation biology class that I teach. So today I'm going to tell you about some invasive species. And uh, thank you for recognizing already what these are. They're lionfish. And you also recognize the fact that they're not in their native range. So uh, they're, they're actually uh, an invasive species throughout the Caribbean. I'll just point out to you um, uh, my website and uh, my email address is here. Uh, and just let me know at the end if you'd like to follow up with me. I'd love to hear from you. So uh, I'm just going to talk a little a brief background about what is an invasive species. And then I'm going to focus on two uh, case studies, one that's a little more recent, one more of a classic, to look at how invasive species have progressed moving uh, into new environments, some of the characteristics that unify invasive species, what makes them good invaders. Uh, and then we'll talk briefly about this sort of timeline or process of invasion, and then how do we control invasive species. So this is a non-native species whose introduction either causes economic or environmental harm to, uh, uh, or, it's cutting off at the end there, sorry. Uh, environmental harm or, or problems to, to humans, basically. So when we start paying attention to invasive species is, is most frequently when uh, we notice economic or human health effects. And humans are really the primary drivers of invasive species. So these introductory pathways that we see with invasive species are usually human uh, driven. And so we can have intentional introductions. So can anyone give me an example of a species that might be intentionally introduced locally or into the US? A rondo. OK, so that was an intentional introduction. And do you know the reason for the introduction of a rondo into the US? Paper production or and or reeds, mouth reeds. Okay, so some product that had utility. We're in an agricultural area here. We have a lot of non-native species that are being grown in the agricultural area, but they have utility. So an intentional introduction might be something for ornamental or agricultural purposes. Um, so a lot of the plants that we grow in our gardens can be uh, potential invasive species. We choose them for their attractive nature, uh, but they can actually be uh, potentially very invasive. So things like water hyacinth is a, an ornamental uh, water plant, but if it gets out into our waterways, it can be uh, very destructive, clog those waterways, those kind, of, those kind of things. We might also see uh, culturally motivated introductions. So a society that was interested to bring sort of uh, a suite of European uh, species, the birds that Shakespeare mentioned in his writings, uh, including things like the European starling that were introduced into the US, uh, started out with an, a small introduction of, a, uh, of 60 birds, now very widespread, over 200 million birds. Um, and other things that have sort of nostalgic interest or cultural interest, people in New Zealand, a lot of them from Northern Europe had this sort of nostalgic feeling about <laughs> hedgehogs and, and they were then introduced uh, into New Zealand. <laughs> it's hiding. Yeah, um, and so there may also be intentional introductions of, uh, of invasive species or non-native species um, to, to act as biological control agents. So there's, with goodwill, we're trying to control things like um, uh, snakes on islands or things like cane toads were introduced to, uh, to deal with the uh, cane beetle. Um, so some purposeful introductions that maybe got a little bit out of hand and now have actually some serious negative effects in those environments that they were introduced into. Um, and then other motivations might be something like sport. We just had a big removal of uh, introduced animals from Santa Rosa Island that were placed there for the purposes of hunting um, and had a really detrimental effect on the environment. And so one of the big management actions that was undertaken on Santa Rosa Island uh, to restore the environment was to actually remove those um, non-native animals. So we also have a lot of accidental introductions. Uh, again, primarily through human activities or associated with human activities, a huge one in the marine environment is from ship's ballast, so accidental introductions, uh, especially into bays and harbors. They tend to be very invaded areas. 
Uh, we also have problems from release of exotic pets. So the Burmese python has been released into the Florida Everglades. Now is extremely numerous and very difficult to capture. There have been some control attempts, but they're really uh, fairly ineffective. Um, and it's really detrimental to a lot of the birds and blizzards um, and amphibians that live in those Florida wetlands uh, are being consumed by uh, the, Burmese, uh, the Burmese python. We also have an issue with the potential invasibility of propagules, so basically uh, either seeds or, or, or shoots like mangroves, uh, uh, red mangroves were introduced into Hawaii, have become an invasive species there, um, can potentially be the source of an invasion. And then uh, rats is another issue that uh, is pervasive around the world. Uh, a recent shipwreck out in the islands was uh, a potential source of rats into a system that they weren't currently existing. Um, and so we have to be very careful with biosecurity in these matters. So I'm going to tell you the first case study is about the, the lionfish that you mentioned, the, the, an Indo-Pacific Indo -Pacific native. It's found um, throughout the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so very broadly distributed in its home range, but was introduced into Florida in the late 1980s, early 1990s, where we... Uh, given the small uh, genetic pool, we assume that this was a, a small number of released animals, probably an aquarium release, out into the environment. Um, and they have become this pervasive, problematic invader spreading throughout the Caribbean in a really rapid period of time. So they have these venomous spines, so venomous dorsal, anal, and pelvic spines that uh, make them well defended against potential predators. And they've also, as you saw in that photograph at the beginning, attained really high densities in this new environment, in the Caribbean environment. Um, so found at much higher densities than in their home range, and also attaining some of the maximum sizes that we see them in the Indo-Pacific. And this is a, a GIF of the invasion timeline, so being introduced, uh, first seen around Fort Lauderdale in Florida, uh, spreading out throughout the 90s and in the early 2000s, being carried by the Gulf Stream up the East Coast. Um, the first time that we became aware of them, I was working in the Bahamas for quite a few years, there was sort of a curiosity that, oh, we found this little baby lionfish that was sort of interesting. Um, and so I have um, sort of personal experience with uh, observing these, entering into a new environment. Um, and then uh, I was working in Panama in 2011, so by then they had uh, invaded the entire Caribbean basin, basically. And so this is one of the issues when working in the marine environment. We have this really high degree of connectivity, which is generally, you know, makes systems very resilient. We get uh, resupply of propagules, those kind of things. Um, but can be, uh, you know, an invasion pathway that, that rapidly accelerates um, things like this lionfish invasion. Um, this is uh, 2013, is basically now throughout the Caribbean basin. So factors that contribute to lionfish being a successful invader, they, they generally have few predators in their native range, but more importantly, in the Caribbean, uh, we've had a lot of fishing pressure for an awful long time. And we fished out most of these large body predators, things like Nassau grouper, things like uh, reef sharks and, and other small sharks that might usually, you know, in, in that sort of size range, be able to handle something like a lionfish. So we fished out the predators, um, and lionfish themselves are incredibly voracious predators. So they have a large gape size, so we, we talk about gape, gape limitation, basically how large of a prey a predator can handle. Uh, these predators have amazingly big mouths that can swallow lots of, lots of different sizes of prey. They're generalists, so they eat a very varied diet. Um, and they have this novel hunting method. So one of the reasons they've been really successful in the Caribbean is they don't look like a predator, right? So they, they're they sort of a little bit funny looking. They've got these these wavy, uh, these wavy um, uh, appendages. So if you were, if you were a little fish swimming around in the water, how would you recognize a predator? What are some characteristics of predators that you would be able to recognize? Yeah? The, the shape and how they get this. Okay, so, so particularly how big it is in relation to you and its shape, yeah? Other characteristics that you might notice? Yes, please. Color. Yeah, so color pattern, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, so lots of teeth can be, can be a giveaway too. Yeah, so very good. So 
So if you're familiar with you know, fish-shaped predators that have big mouths and have a particular color pattern, you might not recognize this fluffy looking thing um, as, as a predatory fish. They also have an interesting uh, behavioral pattern, which I'll show you in just a second, in the way that they hunt. So there's various categories of predators. We can have sit and wait predators that basically wait for something like a mountain lion, waits for something to come along and then it pounces. We can have chase you down predators that will, that will basically outrun fishes. Uh, but the lionfish hunt in a, in a really kind of novel way, and I'll show you that in just a second. So all of this contributes to the fact that they're very fast growers. They're getting a lot of prey. They're well provisioned. They're converting that into uh, body growth. And they're all also converting that into reproductive output. So they can one female lionfish can produce about 2 million eggs a year. So they're really highly fee uh, So we've covered that. Okay, and I wanted to show you uh, this lionfish predation. Okay, and so this is, a, this is one of the feeding methodologies that uh, predatory fishes use. They have this suction feeding. So they basically, uh, by uh, opening their, their gill plates, opening their mouths really wide, generate negative uh, pressure in their mouths. They actually suction feed, they actually suction things in there. So they can sneak up on things and then slurp them up really quickly. So this is obviously <coughs> slowed down an incredible amount, but you can see a little bit of prey there. Didn't really have much of a chance. So they have this really effective method of predation. And is it ready to go on to play? Um, so these lionfish then can have not just this, this impact of predation, they're very effective predators, but they can actually change the systems that they're operating in. So this was a study that was done uh, while I was working in the Bahamas, Mark, Mark Albans and Mark Hickson were looking at the impact of these lionfish on the recruitment, so the joining of the adult population of reef fishes. So a whole suite of different species of reef fishes that have this pelagic dispersal phase. They recruit to reefs, they arrive on reefs, and they join the reef population. So on this axis is the recruitment of fishes, and they had two different treatments. So they had small artificial reefs that either had a lionfish present, so had a predator present, um, or didn't have a predator at all. And then they started out on these artificial reefs by removing all the juvenile fishes, all the newly recruited fishes that were there, and then followed that timeline over five weeks to look at this process of recruitment of fishes arriving out of that pelagic phase and joining the reef population. And so the closed, uh, closed circles here are the, reef, the control reefs, the natural pattern of recruitment of juvenile fishes to these reefs, and then this uh, uh, closed triangles here are recruitment on lionfish reefs. So we see that there's a huge difference after five weeks uh, and, uh, in terms of the recruitment outcomes. So much higher uh, densities of juvenile fishes on these reefs, on reefs that don't have lionfish predators that, as compared to the ones that do. And so there's two potential reasons for this, right? Either lionfish are scaring fish away when they're arriving, they, they say, ooh, scary predator, I'm gonna run away, or they're eating what's arriving. And so to test that, uh, oh, and one other point. So these are the fishes that I worked on the Bahamas. The snappers are an important fishery species. Even, even fish that become large as adults begin life as these little tiny recruits, a couple centimeters long. So almost everything, these voracious predators, almost everything can be eaten by them because they start out in their early life history as being very small, so they don't escape that predation um, mortality. So in order to test whether the lionfish are eating all the things on the reef or just scaring them away, uh, you could do a, a gut content analysis. So basically cut the open the stomachs and see what they're eating, right? So um, this is some of my students in Panama. We were doing this uh, with lionfish to look at the types of prey and the abundance of prey in their stomachs. Um, so it, this is the Hickson data here. Uh, they examined 52 lionfish guts. Most of those had full bellies, so they're eating well. Uh, a variety of diet, right, 10 species from seven different families, so they can eat lots of different things. 
They also are eating not just fish, but also uh, crustacea. So they're not just piscivores, they're carnivores. Um, and they're eating big things, so up to half of their own body length. So this is an example uh, of a soldier fish here that was eaten by that lionfish. So they can eat big prey, they can eat lots of prey. Um, and so the fact that they are these really effective, voracious, generalist carnivores means that they can affect the abundance of fishes on reefs and they can also affect the reef community structure depending on what their targeted prey items are. Oh, and one final thing. The, this is a dissection. They're really well provisioned and they have all this visceral fat that you never see in other fish species when you dissect a lionfish. They have all of this body fat and that essentially gets converted into reproductive output um, when, when the reproductive season comes around. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. So I've never opened up a fish. <laughs> so when, when you're looking in there, like is that fish in there? What do you see when you're opening up? So you, you can actually you see if you open up the gut cavity, you can see the stomach, uh -huh. and you can look at the prey items in there. So you can still identify what's in there. Uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> depending on how much digestion has happened. But uh -huh. yeah, you can you, you can identify even down to species, um, as long okay. as the digestion hasn't been going on that long. So you can, I mean, usually, yeah, you can identify fish, crustacea, depending on how long they've been in the gut. Mm -hmm. So usually, you try and capture them after the the main feeding period. And, I see. Yeah. Good question. So we're seeing these ecosystem level impacts, basically that a single species, an invasive species, is basically uh, impacting organisms, impacting these ecosystems at this community level. Uh, we're seeing loss of ecological functioning. So the loss of predators, again, these, these fish begin life very small, so they're potentially uh, being fished out and that can cause these trophic level effects, the loss of apex predators, just like when you take wolves out of, this, out of the system, the herbivores kind of get a little bit out of control. Uh, the same kind of thing with apex predators on reefs. Also um, impacting herbivores, which are really important parts of the reef system. They control algae that would otherwise potentially overgrow coral. Um, and so we end up with these degraded reefs that are being outcompeted by algae for a lack of herbivores. Um, so they can really actually change uh, the ecosystem level. And so how do we deal with this? Management approaches to lionfish control can include things like targeted control fishing. So these have been some experimental studies to try and reduce numbers of lionfish to see if we can actually do away with um, or, or, or reduce their impact on these ecosystems. Uh, you can actually reduce the density of lionfishes and so reduce some of that predation. You can also um, reduce their average size a little bit and that can reduce their reproductive output. But these are only temporary measures, they're not really uh, a long-term solution. And so a better solution that Don was talking about um, is encouraging a fishery for them. And so that can be either commercial fishery or recreational fisheries. And uh, we can also incentivize this with uh, derbies, like basically an online fish roundup. That's a great idea, that's very popular. Um, and then there might be a big cookout like this where we cook lionfish lots of different ways and everybody gets to feast. So that can reduce numbers. Uh, one of the drawbacks of this method though is that people can sort of hoard lionfish. They can basically let those numbers build up until there's enough for a big derby. So uh, We can also educate uh, fishermen about how to catch fish, how to handle them safely, because these are venomous fishes, um, and how to cook them safely so that the, the, those uh, venom is, is denatured. Um, and they're actually really delicious fish. They're, the fact that they eat a lot of things and they eat a lot of, um, uh, a lot of fishes and a lot of crustacea means they're really delicious to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. And we can also uh, incentivize fishing with some policy changes. So uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission have actually encouraged uh, fishermen who are out fishing on reefs uh, the incentive is you get to take an extra lobster home. If you can catch an extra lobster, you get to take that home in addition to your bag limit if you've also caught 10 lionfish on the same day. So small local level policy changes can actually incentivize fishing for these fishes. Um, and I fear that I'm going to run out of time for my brown cheese snake example, but I'll just give you the quick overview. This is a classic uh, a classic example of an organism and, uh, being introduced into a system and then becoming, um, again, an invasive predator. So this is a, a snake that is native to Northern Australia, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. Um, and it was introduced into Guam 
Um, after World War II, uh, just a, 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 maybe a, a few snakes uh, sort of laid low for a decade or so. People started to notice them in the 1950s, um, but they really took off throughout the 1970s, 1980s, uh, caused immense destruction of the, of the bird community, the extinction of things like the Guam flycatcher, which the name is down here. <laughs> um, uh, so a really, uh, a really really uh, impactful um, invasion. Now there's about two million species there. And we're seeing economic effects. I mentioned at the beginning those economic effects uh, due to uh, things like power outages. And so part of the direct impact that they've had is they've extirpated about 10 of the native species, native bird species on Guam, and two out of three of the bats. Uh, and so the remaining one is now the Mariana fruit bat. Uh, I'm just going to skip through this. Um, and so we've seen this direct impact of the loss of the forest birds, but um, we've also seen multiple additional impacts on the ecosystem, these ecosystem level effects. So we've seen a loss of vertebrates from the island, and with those we lose the ecosystem services that they provide. So things like uh, pollination that is done by bats and birds, seed dispersal, uh, and, and basically a, a loss of those to the food webs. So because trees are not being uh, pollinated, they're not making seeds, um, and if they do make seeds, those seeds are not being um, uh, propagated, not being spread around. Um, and we've also seen, because there's no birds there now, this huge increase in spider population. So there's about 40 times as many spiders um, on Guam as you would see on other nearby islands like um, Saipan um, that haven't had this excessive impact uh, of the brown tree snake. Um, other secondary effects, because um, normally when a forest gap opens up through a tree fall or something, pioneer species come in, those fast growing seeds that germinate quickly, grow fast and fill that canopy gap. Uh, we've actually had, um, because there's no dispersal of seeds anymore because of the loss of the birds, uh, those canopy gaps don't get filled and that leads to local um, microclimate effects, a drier forest, more open forest canopy. And so there have been some conservation efforts uh, and that includes fencing off areas, trying to exclude snakes from restricted areas. Uh, and some uh, part of the motivation for that was to reintroduce uh, what is currently uh, being uh, captive bred, the Guam rail, a, a ground dwelling bird. Uh, we could also think about establishing secondary populations on these nearby northern Mariana Islands for um, some of these endangered birds. And then the the latest effort at population control for the snake, remember there's two million, two million snakes on this relatively small island, is this innovative solution that's been proposed. So you see there's Tylenol in the corner here. So acetaminophen, about 80 milligrams of acetaminophen can kill a snake, but it's not very persistent in the environment. It's not very widely toxic. So the way that they're delivering this um, well, there have been a few trial runs of this now, but uh, they've recently been refunded for a fourth effort. Um, the, the way to deliver this um, uh, bait and toxin to these arboreal snakes, right, the tree dwelling <coughs> snakes, is to create, so this is a little mouse with an acetaminophen pill in there, and then it's glued to a piece of cardboard, and there's another piece of cardboard over here, and then there's a paper streamer that's concertina and then they wing these out of the helicopter, and they settle <laughs> in the trees, and then, in theory, the snakes come along and eat them and, and then quickly die. Humanely, I'm sure. Gently kill them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and so that's one, one method that they're looking at uh, for trying to control this, this species in Guam. Uh, and I think I'm running out of time, so... You're okay. You're um, okay. So I'll just talk a little bit about some general characteristics of invasive species. So these are ones like the Guam tree snake that is uh, broadly distributed throughout its range. Um, so has a lot of, um, uh, it's very tolerant to a lot of different environmental conditions. They're, they, um, organisms that can be found at high densities in their native range, like the South African um, ice plant that we see a lot around here. It grows into big monocultures. Uh, species that have rapid generation turnovers, like annual plants, or ones that make a lot of propagules, a lot of seeds, like that brassica, um, that's another local invasive plant. Um, and ones that re can reproduce or spread asexually. So you can have a very small founder population, 
things like uh, Calerpa algae that's locally invasive on the Channel Islands here um, uh, can be very effective invaders. And we've been talking recently uh, at this conference that we just went to about this enemy escape hypothesis where um, organisms are introduced into an environment where they don't have predators and they don't have pathogens. And the example um, for this would be the red mangrove in, introduced into Hawaii. There's very little uh, grazing, there's very little predation or, or um, uh, you know, very little enemies to the red mangrove, and so it's done incredibly well as now in fact invasive species there. Um, so they tend to be introduced without some sort of control mechanism. Um, they're highly adaptable, so they can adapt to new environments very easily. Um, and then uh, we should just note that the, the time at which we want to control an invasive species is really at the top of this timeline. So if we can prevent the introduction, if we can have good biosecurity measures, we can actually prevent introductions. That's, a, that's the easiest, cheapest method of control. And then this, this arrow on the side says cost and difficulty. So as an invasion progresses, uh, introduction can happen doesn't necessarily mean that an organism is going to become established. Establishment can happen, but doesn't necessarily mean that the population is going to grow out of control. It can start to spread. Uh, we start to see the detectable consequences, either economic or human health or on crops, um, and then eventually may come to dominate the ecosystem like the, green, uh, like the brown tree snake. So if we can intervene higher in this process, then that will tend to be a much cheaper and more easy uh, control of the invasive species. Um, and then the final slide is a few different methods that we can use to control invasive species. We can use these biosecurity measures. This is a big deal on Santa Rosa Island right now, uh, trying to uh, prevent the introduction of species that have the potential to be invaders. And that can be through quarantine measures, through uh, uh, inspecting those dispersal vectors, so that might be checking your boots as you're going out to the island, um, or it might be uh, ballast control uh, uh, mechanisms for ships. Um, we can also try and chemically or mechanically eradicate invasive species. Sean's done some work in, uh, in Louisiana looking at pesticide control of invasive trees. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. It can be very expensive <laughs> and um, with you know, a variety of positive outcomes, uh, but not, it's not a guaranteed method. And then the final method might be a biological control um, uh, that is, you know, potentially a cheap way uh, of controlling uh, populations, but uh, can come along with its own potential problems, like the cane toad in Australia, as an example, um, needs to be well researched. And I'll just give you the one example of that was this introduction. So this is a place, a marine lab I worked at in <coughs> French Polynesia. Um, this glassy-winged sharpshooter is an agricultural crop pest that was introduced. Uh, into French Polynesia was a huge um, economic and, and agricultural problem, but also a social nuisance that you couldn't walk under a tree in French Polynesia without getting peed on by one of these flies. Um, <laughs> so, and so uh, the Berkeley and the French Polynesian uh, Agricultural Service did a lot of research to find this very host-specific parasitoid wasp that actually is only associated with this species of glassy-winged sharpshooter. And these parasitoid wasps, these, this very tight relationship, basically exerts a predator control or a parasite control on the glassy-winged sharpshooter. So within about a year of the introduction, a, a lot of research went on, bef went on before they actually released the parasitoid wasp. But um, after the release, uh, actually knocked down the glassy-winged sharpshooter population to about 10% of its um, invasive peak uh, and has since sort of carried along to be a, an effective control measure. So there are, with careful research and, and forward thinking and, and very, very close relationships, uh, possible ways to control invasive species. And there we go. Thanks very much. Any questions?